Salam, Shalom, Peace, Satyakam. Welcome to the Muslim Community Center. My um, name is Hina Khan Mokhtar. I'm one of the board members here at NCC. And it is our pleasure to welcome, and honor to welcome you all here today. It feels like we've been waiting a long time to be able to celebrate this bittersweet day with all of you. Bitter because we mourned in almost 44 million lives lost COVID-19 over the past 18 months. And sweet because the fact that we're able to gather together today is a sign that hope is on the horizon. There's light at the end of the tunnel. As people of faith, we've had various responses to the trials and tribulations that the pandemic brought into our lives. Some of us asked, dear God, why me? And some of us asked, dear God, why not me? There were moments of despair, hope, depression, gratitude, grief, resiliency, anger, and self-reflection all part of the human experience. There were words of wisdom and guidance to be found in our holy scriptures, and also in the words of the poets. Before introducing our distinguished light of speakers, I'd like to share a poem written about the pandemic by the Muslim poet Harun Rashid. fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. Suddenly, Disney is out of magic. Paris is no longer romantic. New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall is no longer a fortress. And Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly become weapons. And not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly, you realize that power, beauty, and money are worthless and can't get you the oxygen you are fighting for. The world continues its life, and it is beautiful. It only puts humans in cages. I think it's sending us a message. You are not necessary. The air, earth, water and sky without you are fine. When you come back, remember that you are my guests, not my masters. So I'm going to now invite my son, Hafid Amin Mokhtar, to come up to the podium. Hafid is the Arabic term for someone who has memorized the entire Holy Quran in Arabic. And so Amin Mukhtar is now going to be reciting the opening chapter of the Holy Quran in Arabic, followed by a translation in English. Assalamu alaikum. Please and blessings be upon you. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين 
صدق الله العظيم In the name of Allah, God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. All praise is for Allah, God, Lord of the worlds. The most compassionate, most merciful. Master of the day of judgment. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Guide us along the straight path. The straight path of those you have blessed, not those you are displeased with or those who are astray. Amen. Amen. is lit from the um, a brazier of a new fire at Easter and that there is that sense of the new beginnings so if all of you if you're comfortable to close your eyes or just focus softly out in front of you and take a couple of deep breaths bringing yourself to being present here in this new beginning Breathing in and breathing out. As you breathe out, breathing out all the losses and sadnesses and breathing them in as a part of who we are. We've lost more than just people to COVID. We've lost a lot of security. Also then, as you breathe in, breathe in the strength, the unity of our presence with each other, and the love and the hope for the future. May it be so. Amen. Bishop Robert Mar of Juan Lopez and Munir Safi, representing the Ian Area Interfaith Council, Martoma Orthodox Church, and MCC East Bay. strange wearing cler clerics because I've been doing everything from home. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it still fits. <laughs> a little, little COVID-19 extra pounds, but it, it, it fits. So I brought with me, um, in our tradition, when we uh, 
celebrate the life of a loved one, we do uh, cards in which we put a, a photo of our loved ones and then on the back side we'll put a prayer. And my niece chose uh, the prayer of uh, Psalms 23, which is, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me besides the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me to lie down in green pastures. And for his name's sake, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear, fear no evil. For thou art with me. And thy rod and thy, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou art anointed my head with oil, my cup overflow. Surely gladness and mercy follow, follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Shumendo. Peace. Given um, time, celebration of life with my family and processing the emotions and going through the five stages of grief I um, put on my human services hat which most of you know me from working with behavioral health and I began to look at the systematic issues that were part of my brother's life his contracting the virus was not by circumstance. And we have to remember that many people who have contracted the virus was not by circumstance, but rather by institutional systematic racism. My brother, when he was released from the mental correction facility, had no process for him to be re-entered, be, re be received back into the community which happens to most men and women who have been incarcerated. Our health system failed him. He did not receive the information he needed in order to protect himself from the beginning of the pandemic, but rather the information he received over the radio was through those who present information that riles one and was unable to hear the truth because of my previous brother. Abel was the oldest. My brother Armando was the second. He died of the last pandemic in the 1990s. And I began to see systematically the same issues about how to address a pandemic, how to get the information out in a manner in which people have the knowledge and the wisdom to protect themselves and others, and not have to rely on a government that was not going to give us the truth. My response to the celebration of his life was to bring to light the truth of why he contracted the virus and why his daughter and grandchildren don't no longer have him with him, with him in their lives. The pandemic is not over. People are still dying. People are still contracting the virus here in the United States and abroad. And we see the same systematic issues in other countries around economics, around religious beliefs, around gender. These issues are still problematic for us and have to be addressed by bringing it into the and unless we are willing to address our own prejudices that we may still hold on to, the next pandemic is not addressed in a way in which we show compassion we find ourselves in today. And so, Pray for those whom we are still losing to this virus. And I pray for the compassion with the light of life may be shed on all those who seek it and share on me. So now
of the uh, team. Uh, I'm not a practice speaker on the video, so I'm nervous to gather my thoughts. Uh, I like my father, uh, Salih Safi, in this pandemic. Um, it took less than a month uh, from him experiencing uh, a low grade uh, fever to him passing from COVID. Uh, you know, it's the well till the water runs dry, and I still reel from the expediency that uh, it all happened because of the, the roller coaster of uh, you know, hopeful medical advice and the clinical forms to intubate or to try to do therapy. I was always authorized by phone or email because we couldn't set up to go to the hospital. And then communicating with him on FaceTime and giving that inadequate. Myself and my siblings took his hand and uh, reassured him and delivered those final goodbyes to him virtually uh, as he took his difficult last breaths. And then also live streaming his, his funeral so that his family and friends could join in sorrow without putting themselves at risk. And then after that, in the days, the weeks, the months that followed, feeling that hurt when people uh, downplayed COVID and then trying to use my sorrows after that as a lesson to take precautions. So now as we re-enter uh, society, half of Americans say COVID has been stressful and they, they worry that they'll never recover. I uh, We have a natural defense mechanism to repress and forget about the difficult times. But you know, as we sit here today and we see the light at the end of this tunnel, and we hope that uh, it's not an oncoming train, uh, another surge in the pandemic, the silver lining is this, I think. Uh, what we're doing here now, finding faith in community uh, with this eyeball to eyeball interaction, we're human, we need this to be social, we need to be good to one another. Uh, so for me, hearing stories from others that my dad was one of the helpers, he helped everybody. And uh, that's where I got, I, get, I feel I get it from too, how I can make someone else feel better uh, and what I can do uh, to help somebody who doesn't have the same fortune that I do. Uh, I just want to continue that legacy. So, but after the fog of uh, this pandemic is lifted from all of us, I hope we can all look back with a grateful clarity and be thankful to each person who brought us to where we are and who better because of it. Thank you. I'd like to invite Jamie Ireland and Elsa Grabowski from Tri Valley Cultural Juice. a poem for our heroes and those whose memory we cherish, written by Sylvia Cabins and Jack Reimer. At the rising of the sun and its going down, we remember them. At the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. At the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. At the shining of the sun and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. At the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. At the beginning of the year and at its end, we remember them. As long as we live, they too will live, for they are a part of us as we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joy we crave to share, we remember them. When we have decisions that are difficult to make, we remember them. When we have achievements that are based on theirs, we remember them. As long as we live, they too shall live, for they were a part of us as we remember them. And now Elsa would like to share a poem that she wrote with her Jewish culture school class. That's cool. It's called A Year Like No Other. Joy this year like no other, we've been worn at home. We've been scratched, struggling through this feeling all alone. And we got but more together than ever before. We got to cook coffee soup and sing on Zoom. We got to zip special treats, not together, but it was sweet.
like to welcome Trish Monroe from the Livermore City Council. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. And I want to thank the organizers for putting this together at this time. Ritual is important in moving forward. This is a ritual that marks a new beginning. We're here to celebrate coming into the light, but I want to really appreciate what Hina said about this being bittersweet. I appreciate being here now, looking at all of you with three-dimensional bodies, with no masks because vaccinations. I really want to dance for joy, but we cannot go forward without remembering the losses. Um, we have heard the loss of a brother. We've heard of the loss of a father from COVID. My father too died during this time, not of COVID, but during COVID. We mourn all of those losses. We have six, over 600,000 have died in the United States and almost 4 million worldwide. And my joy is tempered for sorrow for those lost, for those still suffering, for those who will be lost. It's tempered with lots of comfort for all of us who are bereaved and with hopes for a complete healing in body and soul for all who suffer and for their caregivers. The challenges we faced in this past year and more go well beyond the pandemic. The images of last year remind us all of those challenges. That knee on George Floyd's neck, August's fearsome orange sky from hell or Mordor, I was a Tolkien fan, I still am. The January 6th insurrection and the desecration of our People's House in the Capitol. We all experienced shocks from those moments. I have the privilege of serving on city council, which means I have a, a, a view of the work of what our public servants do. And I want to speak to them and give them the honor and the gratitude that they deserve. These invisible public servants worked tirelessly to manage every one of these problems. They worked tirelessly through the emergencies, through bringing people together at times when we were separated, administering tests, helping with food distribution, developing and implementing emergency plans, assisting with economic issues, much more. I want to offer thanks to them for their heroic efforts in this past year and Thanks for the work that's yet to come because we are really not done with this. And turning back to where we are here now today, we know those challenges are not over. COVID variations are spreading. The vaccine is not available in so many places uh, around the world. Some, including our children under 12, cannot be vaccinated yet. And we have those who refuse to be vaccinated. We have a lot of work to do there. We will be reckoning with the racial and social and economic inequalities for years to come, should we choose to take that on, and I hope and pray we will. The effects of climate change, drought and heat are here now. That orange sky from last summer, I think about that as we, as, as we approach our own summer. And I, I'm terrified. So it would be easy to retreat into the darkness of despair. But we are not here to do that. We're here to set fear aside and walk into the light, because that's all we can do. And so I want to leave you with the words of Reb Nachman of Breslov. He was a Hasidic rabbi from the late 18th century. And he said, kol kulo, the whole world, gesher tsar ma'od, is a very narrow bridge. The ikar, the, the kernel of it, the most important thing, that nut of, of, of all, the heart of it all. Lo lefatach klai is not to fear at all. Don't fear. Lo lefatach klai. So in full acceptance of those challenges that face us together, let us join hands, and that's difficult on a narrow bridge, but we're gonna do it anyway. Join hands and travel that narrow bridge.
toward the light. Let us go forward together. from Tri Valley Interfaith Interconnect. because what I'm going to talk about has something to do with the statement. And it is to enrich, inform, and educate ourselves and others about the great diversity of faiths and cultures in the triangle. So, how many of you during this terrible pandemic year had to postpone a life ritual, uh, maybe in your family or maybe in the families of people that you know, your relatives. Raise your hand. Wow, a lot of you. Well, our family had to postpone two weddings. And um, the, the wedding that I want to talk about um, under the, the category of hope is um, my partner's grandson and his fiance were going to get married last summer, 2020. Two weeks ago, we went to their wedding, June 13th, 2021. So uh, their life was definitely put on a year's worth of postponement. The um, interesting thing about going to this wedding was we went to the wedding rehearsal and watched it, and I saw six groomsmen and two bridesmaids. I thought, what? What's going on here? And I thought about it for a few minutes, and I realized that the groom, Jamie, had lived in uh, New Jersey, in fact, the same town all his life. And his fiance, Alana, had come from Ukraine uh, six years ago. So, so Jamie had all these friends that he had made in his entire life. And Alana hadn't been here that long. So she didn't have the time she was going to college, she was working. There was no way she could have made intimate friendships the way Jamie did. So we were, we were sitting kind of up and watching the rehearsal. And I looked at these six groomsmen. I was quite taken. Their skin tones ranged from dark brown to light pink. And they, their hairstyles were, you know, beards, long beards, short beards, very long hair, very short hair. And they were all so different from each other. So I asked Jamie, tell me about the groomsmen. He said, well, 
Um, the Sikh child guy, his name is Voltage, his family, and he came from Punjab in India. And uh, the guy standing next to him is Jason, little guy. He's from Korea. And the tall blonde guy is half German and half Ukrainian. And uh, the rotund fellow was a hundred, he said he was a hundred percent Italian. And the uh, last guy was Irish, but with some genes of Native Americans thrown in there too. And Jamie, the groom, was is um, English and Irish. And he's got bright red hair, very short. So I was really impressed with this group of young men who, who came from such different backgrounds. And they, they had a wonderful camaraderie. And they were having such a good time. I was planning to, to have a big uh, picture of these guys. But I, because of circumstances, the fact we're doing this outside, we don't have a big picture. But I'm going to just pass this around. So if somebody is willing to pass it, you'll, you'll see them. OK. So the, the thing that was so interesting to me was they kind of hung out together because until the actual wedding, the groom is not supposed to be with the bride. So here were these six guys laughing and playing ball and just having the most wonderful time. And I think, uh, in, talk, in thinking about this wedding, my favorite memory was at the reception they had music, Ukrainian music and American music. And there was a very lively tune being played, and all seven of the guys got in a circle and started dancing to it. And I thought, somebody talked of a Ukrainian dance, isn't that wonderful? So after the dance was over, I said, Jamie, who taught you the dance? And he said, nobody, we just made it up on the spot. <laughs> anyway, the, you know, my feeling about these kids was that this is what our mission statement describes as one of the goals for the Tri Valley. People of different backgrounds enjoying each other's company and celebrating together. And it's wonderful to see it does happen. Thank you. Somebody come and help me. <laughs> My honor. Thank you. Okay, we have a little pleasant surprise, not a little, a big pleasant surprise um, program, so we're just going to deviate a little bit. It is my honor to um, welcome Congressman Eric Swalwell to come share some thoughts with us. He represents the 15th virus uh, and back to a uh, vaccinated, reopened, reinvigorated uh, community. Uh, but uh, we must not forget uh, what has happened uh, to our country, uh, who we have lost, how we can never repeat some of the mistakes that were made uh, that attributed to the loss, and how we can be stronger as a community uh, as we come out of this. Uh, first and foremost, a uh, thank you to every Healthcare worker, first responder, 
who endured and showed up to work every single day to take care of the sickest of us. Uh, they are the best of us who took care of the sickest of us uh, during our generation's most trying challenge. But also thank you to our interfaith community who stepped up with food banks for those who have lost their job and never imagined that they'd be waiting in an hours long food bank to feed their family. Thank you to those who collected personal protective equipment so that our nurses, firefighters, individuals on the front lines during the early stages of the pandemic could protect themselves so that they could take care of each of us. And thank you for keeping the faith among yourselves, but also for us in the community and transitioning, transitioning responsibly to Zoom so that we could congregate on either Fridays, Saturdays, or Sundays throughout the pandemic because we know that mentally this virus challenged us in many ways almost as strongly as it challenged us physically. And because we could still congregate with our synagogues, our mosques, our churches, we were still connected together. But the world didn't stop with its challenges just because we were indoors. We have continued to see instances of hate, gun violence, challenges in the Middle East, that still call upon all of us to take our collected humanity and project it here at home and across the world for good. And you kept doing that. And I know now that we are unmasked and back in the community, we will keep doing that. And so as the representative for this congressional district, my pledge to you is to also be reinvigorated to serve, to serve you, to serve the cause of America, which is to be a just, fair, humane country that holds itself up not only to ourselves, but to the rest of the world, is a place that believes in freedom. Freedom of religion, and of course, freedom of speech, freedom of our press. And as it relates to gun violence, which has torn us apart just recently with the VTA shooting, the freedom to live. And the faith community continues to come together to make sure that we recognize those freedoms. So today is a day that we mourn those we've lost, but also the best thing that I think we can do for so many of those that we've lost is to celebrate what we have right now and to reaffirm our commitment to make this a country that achieves its most basic and fundamental ideals. So God bless each and every one of you, and thank you for allowing me to play a small part uh, in this very worthy uh, memorial. Thank you. dreams can I imagine what the last year would bring. It was the most challenging year of my nursing career. When the pandemic first began, I was just deployed to case investigations and contact tracing. At that time in February, I recall we only had 15 positive cases of COVID-19 in Alameda County. As of today, we have had close to 90,000 positive cases in Alameda County 
and almost 1,300 deaths. In March of last year, I was deployed to Operation Comfort, where I would spend the next six months. Operation Comfort is a Project Room Key Hotel, and it provided short-term isolation and quarantine housing for people experiencing homelessness with a positive COVID-19 test, active symptoms, or had been in close contact to someone with COVID-19. I felt completely clueless in working with this population as I had only worked with moms and babies before. I was also terrified to get sick or to bring the virus home to my family. There was tremendous chaos the first few weeks of the project, uncertainty about sufficient protective equipment, and the demands of caring for the sick residents was so overwhelming that I cried on my drive home every day for that first week. With masks being in short supply, I reached out to two lovely women from the Eden Area Interfaith Council, Julie Greenfield and Diana Ray Ryan, who graciously offered to donate handmade masks face shields and scrub cats made by volunteers to the public health nurses at the hotels. The supplies felt God sent, and I felt the overwhelming power of community coming together to protect its healthcare workers. On April 17, 2020, a day I'll never forget, a new resident at the hotel, I'll call him David, arrived and I realized that he needed to go to the hospital immediately. I called the ambulance, assisted him to the restroom, and waited with him in the lobby. He was a complete stranger to me, but I still remember the simple gold band on the third finger of his left hand and thinking how much he must love his wife and family despite all the hardships he's faced. I wondered who his family was and thought how hard it must be for him to be away from them. I tried to comfort him and I told him that we were taking care of him that he was in good hands. He nodded his head in understanding. Shortly thereafter, he collapsed. I started performing CPR until the paramedics arrived, but unfortunately, David passed away. For days after, I felt completely lost and devastated. I couldn't sleep, and I would cry out of the blue. I was filled with grief. I sought counseling and had the unconditional support of my family. I thought, why me? I now strongly believe that I was meant to be there for a reason. Like I had a purpose there that day. Because if I was the last person with David in his final moments, I gave him the dignity he deserved and he did not die alone. Like so many unfortunate people during this pandemic. I realize that I have a lot to be grateful for. David will not be forgotten. And I can commemorate him today at this special event. In, in his honor and in honor of those who have been lost to COVID-19, I will continue to do my part to save lives and promote the health of my community. I can proudly say that the Project Room Key Hotels in Alameda County have served almost 1,200 unsheltered residents and over 700 have exited to housing. As of today, with collaboration between many of our community partners, Alameda County has provided over 2 million first dose vaccinations to residents 12 years and over, which is 8% uh, of eligible residents at this time, and 68% of them are fully vaccinated, putting us above national and state averages. On a personal note, working through this pandemic has inspired me to return to school so that I can return to better serve our vulnerable populations. Our work is not yet over, but together we can strive to make our community a better place and overcome all obstacles. Telling about my experiences has been both healing and empowering, and I thank you for listening and for welcoming me here today. Thank you. I want to take a moment to share a quote by Fred Rogers, and you must remember him as Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. This is very touching quote of his. When I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words and I'm always comforted 
by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in the world. So thank you, Ari, for all of your work and dedication during this most difficult period. You and your fellow nurses and healthcare workers put your lives at risk to care for those who are suffering and for all of us. Thank you to all of the healthcare workers and all of the essential workers who made it possible for us to get through this pandemic, to feel cared for, to be fed, and with all of our most important services covered. This is a debt which can never be adequately repaid. And we also wish to recognize all of the community efforts which helped save people's lives, kept them fed, and kept them feeling connected. The Eden Area Interfaith Council did its part by engaging in a mass and PPE making project. Inspired by Congressman Swalwell's call to help, over 100 volunteers produced over 10,000 handmade cloth masks and many hair covers and face shields, which were then distributed to hospitals, homeless shelters, post offices, senior residences, etc. Many churches and community groups offered food boxes, COVID testing, help with accessing social services, and more. To all of you who are part of these efforts, we say thank you. A round of applause for them. Okay, and now I'd like to welcome Joy Barnett from Tri-City Interfaith Council. Good afternoon. I'm here as a representative of the Tri-City Interfaith Council, I'm the current president, but I'm also a volunteer chaplain at Washington Hospital, and the pandemic is personal to me because I could not see the people that I served. Prior to this pandemic, the Tri-City Interfaith Council held a monthly vigil on a very well-traveled corner in downtown Fremont. It was it's a major crossroads. They got lots of recognition, though I'm not sure anybody really was paying attention to the signs. Each month, the specific topic was different. The theme every month was the same. We are one. We are one. The pandemic has made this, that phrase, even more meaningful to me. As a scientist, product developer in the pharmaceutical industry and now a uh, volunteer chaplain. This virus is personal. To all viruses, humans are simply a place to grow, a place to reproduce. They see none of the differences we see. We are all the same regardless of skin color, regardless of income, regardless of faith tradition, regardless of garb. None of that matters to the virus. To the coronavirus, we are all us. There are no thems. So I called into rooms, I talked to very um, I talked to staff who were overwhelmed because there was no space on their floor. I, if I was lucky, I could talk to one, maybe two COVID patients who were getting better. I watched the census rise and fall and rise again. The numbers in the newspapers and on the news became very personal to me. I called the people on the oncology board who could not see their families, who were in for weeks, who had fascinating stories, if they had the energy to talk and do anything more than just catch their breath and sob and be grateful that someone was talking to them other than the staff because the staff had no time. People didn't stop getting sick of normal illnesses during the pandemic. In March 2021, as Alameda celebrated its one year of sheltering in place, the Tri-City Interfaith Council convened on Zoom because we had no idea when this would really end. 
and we do need a 3.8 memorial service similar to this, arranged in three parts. The first was in grief and loss, the second was on community, and the last was on hope. The meditative service was made up of prayers and scripture readings from the many faith traditions that are present on our council. And together we were able to find the ability, the compassion, and the unity, and the resilience to walk together. I just want to share with you the closing prayer from that service. It comes from lifting our voices, greetings in the living tradition. It is a Unitarian Universalist poem. Spirit of life and love, we live in a fragmented world that tempts us to despair. We would put it back together, piece by piece, if it were ours to choose, but sometimes the fragments are enough. In a world of cruelty, there is still power in every act of kindness. In a time of doubt, there is still power in every act of hope. In an age of division, there is still power in every act of unity. May we remember that sometimes the fragments of meaning we make to Congressman Eric Swalwell represented him with a little gift of appreciation. Oh, thank you. I got a size large because I know she's expecting. <laughs> 20 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I also have extra. Oh, that's for me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank so you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. So well. thank you. Okay, next I'd like to invite Leslie Miro from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. opportunity to share my thoughts at this event. A month before the COVID-19 pandemic forced us into a lockdown situation, my little two-year-old grandson was in the hospital with a very bad case of RSV, which is an infection of the respiratory tract. He's my little miracle grandbaby, a micro preemie having weighed just 1.2 pounds at birth. Once he recovered and came home from the hospital, my son and daughter-in-law asked me if I would watch him full-time until he was completely recovered and could go back to preschool. Less than a month later, the pandemic forced the preschool to close and my son and daughter-in-law began working from home. Masks and germ control were already part of their, their world and my world as well. And we all just doubled and tripled our efforts to stay well and keep my grandson well. I'm extremely grateful that my little family did stay well. I live with my 85-year-old mother and I'm grateful that she also was not affected by COVID. My heart mourns for the millions of lives lost. My family was personally affected by this terrible disease. One of my nieces had family members pass away. Another niece pregnant with her third child came down with COVID, catching it from her husband who had caught it from a coworker. Although sick for several weeks, they fortunately had fairly mild cases and recovered, and she has since given birth to a beautiful baby boy. A friend and member of my church congregation who suffers from very severe asthma 
spent two weeks in critical condition in the ICU with COVID. Four months later, she's still in respiratory therapy and has had to change her lifestyle and scale back her physical activity. I know so many other friends whose, whose families were impacted by this virus. I have friends who lost parents, who lost brothers and sisters. I'm so very grateful for paramedics, nurses, doctors, and specialists who worked so hard to protect and care for those who were ill. In the middle of the pandemic, my oldest son was involved in a serious car accident and was in the ICU for two weeks at Eden Hospital. The bishop of my church congregation is an emergency room nurse there, and he's the one that called me. I was grateful that I received a call from him and that he was able to provide details of the injuries to me in a way that I could understand, and that he was able to provide emotional and spiritual support to me during that very stressful period of time. It was a miracle that the very week of his accident, Eden was starting to allow one visitor at a time into the hospital rooms, or into the, into the ICU at least, for a very limited window to visit. I was able to be with my son every day during his hospital stay. I was amazed at the safety protocols that they had implemented at Eden, and I'm sure all hospitals were the same. I'm grateful that my son has recovered well, and I'm grateful for the hundreds of thousands who worked so hard and so quickly to develop the vaccine. To all those who have helped administer it, I'm grateful. My entire family has been vaccinated, and we are all very thankful. For those listening who have suffered illness, death in their families, loneliness, and isolation, please know that I am deeply sorry. This pandemic has been a trial of our faith and has tested our patience in every way. I would like to close with a thought from one of my church's senior leaders, Peter F. Newport. He said, often the deep valleys of our present will be understood only by looking back on them from the mountain of our future experience. Often we can't see the Lord's hand in our lives until long after trials have passed. Often the most difficult times of our lives are essential building blocks that form the foundation of our character and pave the way to future opportunity, understanding, and happiness. I continue to pray that we will all trust the Lord's timing and his promises. Let us all try to be of help and service to our family, friends, and neighbors. I pray that we will stay strong and stay well. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and for inviting me. The Hasidic Rebbe, the Benachem Mendel of Kutz, said, there's nothing more whole than a broken heart. In other words, when our heart breaks, it opens up and it provides an opening for someone to embrace you and to listen to you or for you to listen to somebody and embrace them. Loss is part of the everyday fabric of the universe and it always remains a part of us. After a painful loss, life continues but it's gonna be different than it was before. So today happens to be a Jewish holiday. It's called the 17th, 17th day of the Hebrew month of Tammuz, Shiva Sarva Tammuz. It's a minor fast day, and it's the start to what we know as the three weeks of spiritual introspect, introspection and mourning that leads up to a major fast day that's called the ninth day of Av, Tisha B'Av. According to the rabbis, it's not only the day when the walls of the second temple in Jerusalem were breached, leading to its destruction three weeks later in the year 70 in the common era. But a lot of other calamities happened on this date, which affected the Jewish people, including when it was said that Moses broke the first set of tablets when he came down from the mountain and he saw the golden calf. 
So we have these images of the breaching of city walls, the breaking of sacred tablets. We have this image of shattered, broken stone. So we're not strangers to brokenness. We know that what has been built can be torn down, that what can, is secure can be suddenly taken away, and that what is sacred can be desecrated and destroyed. And wherever we stand in the midst of fragments of shattered hope or of broken lives, we sometimes ask the question, well, what went wrong? But in this season, which is a moment of spiritual reflection, we're also summoned to ask, what will we do now? What can we build together? What's new, perhaps still unseen? What new possibilities are still being born? Because a fast day, it's not just a sad day, but it's an opportunity to renew our spiritual connections. It's a day when we're empowered to awaken our hearts, to see where the foundations of our lives, the foundations of our families, of our communities, of our countries, to look out and see where are they imperiled? Where are the fractures now? Where are the breaks? And what can we do together to repair them now? So I'm going to chant a prayer. It's the shortest healing prayer in the Bible, in the Torah. It's the one that was said that Moses said on behalf of Miriam when she became ill. The words are El Narafan Allah, which just means please heal her. And after I finish sort of chanting it, I'm going to repeat the last nine line, last line, Rifanala. And I'm going to just keep chanting it over and over. And that's going to be an opportunity for all of you to call out either people who need healing or issues, places, uh, things in our world, in our society that need healing. And just feel free to call out from wherever you're sitting. <clears throat> Peace be with you all. Uh, I just want to share, uh, it seemed like on this occasion, the peace prayer of St. Francis of Assisi would be most appropriate. St. Francis was a pioneer of interfaith understanding in his day. He was canonized in the 12th century. He's the patron saint of ecology of the state of, of the nation of Italy. And um, his prayer, the peace prayer, speaks to all those who are healers, all those who help one another during this pandemic. So the peace prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, 
joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to, uh, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Reverend Dr. Arlene K. Marin from the Eden United Church of Christ. Um, I'm the senior minister at Eden United Church of Christ in the Cherryland neighborhood of Hayward. Um, our congregation is proud to be one of the founding members of the Eden Area Interfaith Council and pleased and honored to be here today to be a part of this important observance. Uh, my congregation is situated in Cherryland, which uh, is in the 94541 zip code. We are one of the zip codes in Alameda County in the state of California and the United States of America, probably in the global village uh, most affected by the COVID virus. Um, we have a high percentage of uh, essential workers, um, low-income people, people who are uh, living in densely populated areas as well as in high-density housing. Um, and uh, we have uh, both uh, been challenged and privileged to try to be a part of the answer to the prayers that we seek by uh, providing food, emergency food assistance, um, PPE, uh, sanitation products, uh, COVID testing, COVID vaccination, CICT tracing, outreach and health education, and emergency food service delivery. Our uh, profile has been substantially raised in this pandemic, um, which has been an interesting kind of thing, and we've received a lot of um, thanks and appreciation for that. Um, but I want to I want to share why I think that that has been possible for our congregation, and it's a, it's a lesser known but more important story I think to share, and um, it has to do really with I would say two groups of people. One is undocumented Spanish-speaking mothers, and the other is our interfaith friends. When undocumented, unaccompanied minors in our school district had nothing to eat, no jobs to go to to make money, and no restaurants or grocery stores they could go to, even if they had jobs and money, and they called their counselors and teachers and begged for food. The counselors and teachers called us. They said, Pastor Arlene, we don't know what to do. Our kids are hungry. And thinking like intelligent middle class people that they were, they're like, would you donate $50 for one kid so I could get him a food card? And I said, well, I'm willing to do that. But the food card won't be, or the, the gift card won't be any good because the restaurants are closed. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I said, so I don't think that's gonna work, but we have a kitchen and we have some groceries and I know some people. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out and asked undocumented Spanish speaking mothers who will never have papers who will never be allowed to be citizens of this country or experience the benefits that most of us enjoy. Would you come and donate lots of your time so that we can provide these children with food? And they said, of course. I said, I can't pay you. They said, it doesn't matter. The children are hungry. And together, we serve 5,000 meals. And 
until the government got their act together enough to provide pandemic EBT for these children. And the food was delivered by some of the people sitting in the chairs right here. And when the children in our school district needed school supplies, and they didn't have Wi-Fi, and they didn't have laptops, and they just needed pieces of paper to do their school work, kind of like the old days, you know, like uh, correspondence courses. Uh, leaders from the synagogue in Castro Valley continued not only to help us with that effort, but to really triple what we had been able to provide. And then when the parent engagement specialist from Fairview Elementary, which is another uh, elementary school in the unincorporated community, found out that Cherryland had a benefactor. <laughs> she called me up and said, Pastor Arvin, can you help us? And I said, well, oh my God, <laughs> we're dying. I mean, I had to, I didn't have a day off. It's about that. said, you know, I have some good friends at the Hayward Bar. They're really close to your school. How about if I call them and see if they can help you? And she's like, that would be beautiful, Pastor And I reached out to the bar, and the leaders said, oh, we don't just want to do that for the neediest children. We want to provide school supplies for all the children at Fairview Elementary School. And then the retired parent engagement specialist from Bearview Elementary found out what we were doing. Uh, and she happens to be a leader in the Jane community in San Jose. And she called me up and she said, Pastor Arlene, we want to help. How can we help? Um, and we talked about things they wanted to bring food. And we kind of decided that the Mexican diet wasn't really that compatible with the Jane diet. <laughs> they might not just have that kind of food on their shelves. I said, you know, people really need cleaning supplies and they need sanitation supplies. What do you think about that? And she said, no problem, Pastor. We can do that. And so when the number of people that came to our food pantry quadrupled, and they weren't just from Cherryland, they were from all over in these unincorporated and South Alameda County neighborhoods, we were able to meet that need. We were able to meet that need. So I just shared with you those kinds of examples because they show uh, not only the need, but more importantly, the power especially in hard times, and our capacity for good in the face of evil. So God bless all of you. Thank you for being a part of the answers to the prayers that the whole world needs. Amen. Mushin Sabatan from the Pleasanton Baha'i community. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a blessing to be here with you all today. Um, as a member of the Baha'i faith, we believe that all people belong to one human family. The loss of life in our area, our nation, and the world as a whole to COVID 19 has been an ongoing tragedy for all of us. We take comfort in the belief that our souls continue their journey towards God in the next world, and we pray for the progress of those who have passed away. In memory of those who have passed on, I will be saying a Baha'i prayer for the departed. Oh my God, oh my God, verily thy servant, 
humble before the majesty of my divine supremacy, lowly at the door of my oneness, hath believed in me and in thy verses, hath testified to thy word, hath been enkindled with the fire of thy love, hath been immersed in the depths of the ocean of thy knowledge, hath been attracted by thy breezes, hath relied upon thee, hath turned his face to thee, hath offered his supplications to thee, and hath been assured of thy pardon and forgiveness. He hath abandoned this mortal life, and hath flown to the kingdom of immortality, yearning for the favor of meeting thee. O Lord, glorify his station, shelter him under the pavilion of thy supreme mercy, cause him to enter thy glorious paradise, and perpetuate his existence in thine exalted rose garden, that he may plunge into the sea of light in the world of mysteries. Verily thou art the generous, the powerful, the forgiver, and the bestower. I'd like to invite Sony Carr, Gadan Singh, and Manjit Singh from the Hayward Sith Gurdwara Choir. Oh, my God. 
Regardless of circumstances, being in optimism. In our main or thus or prayer, we ask God to keep our man niva and our mat uchi. That translates to mean to keep our man or our mind's ego low while keeping our mat or our willpower high. Of course, that is way tougher to do in trying times, but it I strongly believe if we can aim for it, then we can compare how close or far we actually are to that state of mind and hopefully work towards a more optimistic outlook. The previous hymns that I just sung, um, those are called sloks and they're actually like the introduction of the theme to the main Shabbat that I'm now about to sing. Singing is a really big part of our faith as I'm sure is true for many others here. Um, so first I want to break down the first line just for pronunciation and meaning and then I would really appreciate it if we could all sing together. The first line.
प्लीज रिपीट ताकी वाव ना लगी पार ब्रह्म सरनाई वेरी गुड ताकी मीन्स हॉट वाव मीन्स हवा और एयर ना मीन्स नॉट लगी मीन्स टू अफेक्ट पार ब्रह्म इज जस्ट नॉट वर्क फॉर गॉड एंड सरनाई मीन्स इन गॉड सेंचुरी
peaceful and calming way to end our gathering today. Um, before we close out, we can end with a poem and finish with a 30 second poem and we will all be on our way home safely and in health without knowing. So this poem is by the poet Kitty Omira. It's called In the Time of Pandemic. In the Time of Pandemic by Kitty Omira. And the people stayed home and they read books listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still. And they listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamt new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. God. Thank you, everyone. May we meet in health and happiness and joyous celebration. <laughs>